Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to be back here again. Nice to see some familiar faces. Lovely to see you again, my friend. It's been a long time. Uh, so this afternoon, I've got the honor and the privilege of introducing this great book that you see on the screen behind me. And I thought I would do it with a PowerPoint, something a little bit different. Uh, I also had um, an idea that there may not be a flip chart here at the front. Uh, <laughs> it's a little dig at Cal. Anyway, just a joke. So, private joke. So I thought I'd do it on a, fl on a PowerPoint. So how many of you have read this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Put your hand nice and high. And keep your, only, only put your hand up if you've actually finished the book. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I say that because the first time I read this book, I didn't finish it. Because it's, uh, it's quite an academic read, it's quite a heavy read. And uh, I was curious and fascinated that uh, when I met people and I asked them about this book and I told them that I never finished it the first time, I met lots of people who said, wow, I never finished it either. So many years later, when Stephen Covey came to speak in South Africa for the first time, I was in the audience with 2,000 people and he was phenomenal. How many of you actually saw this man speak live? If you ever had that gift or that privilege. Phenomenal man, right? He's obviously no longer alive. Uh, he's now moved to the next plane, but what a fantastic man. He affected millions and millions of people. This is actually the cover of the book that I have. This one right here. And as it says there, it says 15 million copies sold. And that was some time back. It's now sold over 25 million copies, translated into 40 different languages around the world, right? So phenomenal book. And it sold nearly 2 million copies in audio version. How many of you actually got the audio version besides Khaled? You're listening to it right now. It's a brilliant book, right? So if you're not a reader, then the audio version is brilliant. It's phenomenal. And this book here, what it does is it covers the seven habits of highly effective people. Now, what is an effective person? An effective person is somebody who manages themselves effectively and is somebody who is a leader of themselves in their own communities, in their own lives. And it talks about the seven habits. And... You know, it says, yeah, the first one is being proactive. Being proactive. What does proactive mean? Well, he speaks about proactivity means that you are in control of how you respond to the world. You're not reactive. Very different. Being responsive, being reactive. If you're responsive, it means you take time to think about your next action, your next thought, your next deed. Being reactive means knee-jerk reaction and you react to the world around you. And Stephen Covey says that the most effective people on the planet are the people who are proactive. They're proactively thinking about what they're going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and they respond effectively to the environment that they're in. When something happens, they take time to think about what they're going to act or their ne next action will be. He then says that habit two is beginning with the end in mind. And I heard him say this in his presentation in South Africa, and he said this to many audiences. He used to encourage his audiences to think with the end in mind, to start any project with the end in mind. Now, what does that mean? Well, he told people that he encouraged them that they should go all the way to the end of their own life. And they should imagine their own funeral and imagining attending their own funeral and listening to the five most important people in their own lives talking about them at their own funeral. He said that would be a good way to start your life from this day forward. He said, now that may sound quite somber and dark, but he encourages his audience to do it. And he said that what that's going to give you, it's going to give you an, a massive insight and your own perspective into your own values and your own, your own purpose and your own goals in life. Because if you went to your own funeral and you imagined the five most important people at your, in, your, in your life talking about you at your funeral, what would you want them to say about you? How would you want them to remember you? What kind of legacy would they be praising in your honor at your funeral? So, great thing to do, beginning with the end in mind. Any project you're going to start, anything you do, Tony Robbins says the same thing. Begin with your, your outcome. What is your ultimate outcome? Step one. Then, the third habit is putting things first. Putting first things first. And in fact, what Stephen Covey did was he developed this quadrant. How many of you are familiar with the quadrant that he developed? The urgent, important quadrant. Right? And he says that the most important area of the quadrant was the one second to the right. And... You've got four quadrants. One, two, three, four. So two was the most important quadrant. That is the important quadrant, but not urgent. So you've got important and urgent. And the second quadrant was where most effective people spend most of their time. Effective leaders. That is the quadrant where things are important, but not urgent. If you transpose that with the first quadrant where things are urgent and important, in other words, now what you're doing is you're putting out fires, you're keeping up with other people, you're managing things that are crisis, that have already arrived at a crisis, become a crisis. You transpose it with the second quadrant where you're actually now planning. You're preparing for things that are ahead of you. You are now developing relationships. 
you are focusing on your ability to be an effective leader. So that's the most important quadrant, putting first things first. In other words, what are the things that are important but not urgent? Important is your health, your relationships, your business, your finance, your personal development, your spiritual development. If you focus on those things and prepare in advance and plan your life ahead of time, then what you find is you now start to manage yourself more effectively. Then, fourth habit is think win-win. Think win-win. Isn't that an interesting one? It's amazing how many people go into some kind of business development or some kind of meeting or some kind of relationship thinking, well, what can I get out of this? Right? Instead of thinking, what value can I offer? How can I create a win-win? And what Stephen Covey used to say is, is that if you can't create a win-win situation, then it's far better to create a lose-lose. In other words, you agree to disagree and not to start any venture unless it's win-win. In other words, you've got win-win, lose-lose, and the other two are win-lose or lose-win. So nobody wins in either of those, right? So it's far better to say to yourself, listen, we're not creating a win-win here, so let's agree to create a lose-lose. Neither of us go any further forward with this project, because if you win and I lose, that's not fair, and if I win and you lose, that's not fair either. So it's either win-win or nothing. So a very, very good way to approach everything, right? Think win-win in every scenario. Then habit number five is to seek first to understand before you want to be understood. Natasha had said something about actively listening earlier. Brian Tracy says the same thing. To actively listen to another human being means to really hear what they're saying. Most people don't listen and hear at the same time. They're listening, thinking about their own response, about what the other person's saying. So they're already planning their own response to the person who's speaking at that particular moment in time. But when you actively listen and you seek to understand before you want to be understood, that is a very, very powerful thing to do. The amount of times that I've been to a networking event where I've only listened to people, I've asked them two or three questions. What their names are, what is it they do, and how can I help them to further their business? And all I've done is listen. And then I've got messages from people, loads of messages. People say, wow, it was so fantastic speaking to you, so fantastic learning all about you. You know, it was so great to connect with you. And I'll think to myself, wow, all I did was ask them two or three questions and I listened. People love to speak. <laughs> True or not? Yeah. yeah. So the most effective way to be a great networker is to seek to understand what people want to do and what people are up to in their own life. Before you want to be understood, it's amazing how many people you listen to, how many people you connect with, and all they want to do is speak. And as soon as you finish speaking, they straight into their own answer. Instead of pausing and thinking, wow, yes, and then picking up on what you've said. It makes you a very active listener. It's a very, very powerful thing to do. Then habit number, four, habit number six is to synergize. Synergize. What does that mean? That means to work together. To work together with people. To look where you can collaborate and help other people. To synergize. We all have things in common. We are unique, as Natasha pointed out, we are individuals. However, we also have overlap. We also have lots of things where we can collaborate and work together on. And synergistic approach to business is a very, very powerful thing to do. Competition is the old way of doing business. Competitive is, if you look at being competition or competing with someone, really what it means, if you look at the Latin root word of the word competition, it means to conspire together, to bring out the best in each other. And yet we live in a world where as early as five or six years of age now, we're teaching our children to compete with other kids. And you don't matter unless you are number one. And now what people do is they get into business and they're competing. Instead of looking, how can I collaborate? How can I connect with other people? How can I find out who's doing something similar to me and where we can get together and maybe we can bring out the best in each other and we can synergize and create something even bigger than that. Even bigger than I can do on my own. So synergize habit number six. And then number seven to sharpen the saw. And if I move on to the next thing here, the next slide, and I can come back to number seven. You see, when I was asked if I could do a book review, and basically it was a conversation between Callan and myself, and I said, I'd love to come back and be involved in this networking environment as often as I can. And I know I only live a little bit down the road, down the M40, uh, but it's lovely to come back, and I've been back here three or four times now. And when I discussed with Cal, you know, what can I do in terms of you know, getting involved? And he said, well, how about doing a book review? And I thought, well, I'd love to review. There's lots of books I could review. And I thought, well, when I thought I'm going to come up, when I'm going to review the seven habits, I thought, well, let me do it in this format. And I started looking at images 
that I could put together in this little short slide presentation, I came across the, this image and I thought this is perfect. Because when you look here down at the bottom end of this image, here, you see dependence. These are people who are depending on other people. Depending on other people to get through life. And if you look at a different quadrant by a different person, Robert Kiyosaki, when he spoke about the cash flow quadrant, how many of you are familiar with that quadrant? And in the left quadrant, quadrant number one on the cash flow quadrant, is an E for employees. And if you're an employee, it means you are swapping time for money. In other words, you are a trader. Every single person is a trader. It just depends what you're trading. And employees are trading time for money. That's the poorest trade you can make. In other words, you're depending on someone else for your livelihood. So most of these people down here are employees. Now, nothing wrong with being an employee. I'm not knocking it. However, if you're on a great ladder of success and you have big ambitions and you want to grow into a bigger position and you want to take on more responsibility and you're in a company that's going to help you to progress and help you with ambition, fantastic. But most companies are not like that. So... To be dependent means to rely on someone else for your well-being or for your livelihood. And being proactive immediately lifts you out of this area because now suddenly you're thinking differently because most people are reactive. And being proactive means you are thinking about how you want to proceed in life and you are being proactive in the way you respond to life. You're taking responsibility, as Natasha said earlier, responsibility. Probably one of the most powerful words in the English language because the ability to respond. That's what it means if you break that word down. And then habit number two is beginning with the end in mind. And that means you're now into the private victory. You're now starting to manage yourself more effectively. You're now starting to become somebody who leads themselves effectively. You're now into the process of self-leadership. You're starting to make private victories. When you start thinking of first things first and you're starting to put the outcome as step one, how can I create a business and then what can I get from this business? How can I bring more value to my clients? But ultimately, how do I want to leverage myself out of this business? In other words, if you build a business, a lot of business people will tell you now, the smartest way to build a business is to start thinking about your exit strategy. Are you going to sell this business in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time? Or are you going to leave it to your son and your daughters? You know, depending on what that is. So it's thinking with the first things first. And now you're starting to become independent. When you're thinking win-win, you're starting to look about how you can collaborate and connect with other people and connect with other people and create win-win situations and synergize, as habit number six says, and look for people that have overlap with you and look at how you can create something much bigger than doing it individually. And then you're starting to understand people, looking to understand people before you want to be understood. Now you're looking at public victories. Now you're starting to create a public victory. You're starting to connect with other people and starting to grow your victory and make it much larger. Interdependence is where you want to be. You're no longer dependent on someone else. You're not independent, which means you're alone in life. A lot of soul traders are alone. A lot of self-employed self, sorry, self -employed people are alone. The one-man bands, maybe two people helping them out. But you want to start growing a team. Because that makes you interdependent. When you start working with other businesses in your areas or local area and you start collaborating and synergizing, you start becoming interdependent. And that's what we are as human beings. We are interdependent. We can't win the life on our own. We can't win this game of life on our own. We need to be interdependent. We need to work with other people. We need to connect with other people. We need to build teams. We need to build communities. And then coming back to habit number seven, as I said, which encompasses the other six habits here, is sharpening the saw. How many of you know what that means, sharpening the saw, if you have an indication of what that might mean? How many of you are not quite sure what it means? Sharpening the saw means, it reminds me of the great quote, uh, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first four hours sharpening the axe. Right? So to sharpen your own saw means that you want to consistently work on yourself. You want to consistently work on yourself. Read the right books, hang around the right people, go to the right networking events, connect with other people. If you come to a networking event like this and you hear of somebody who gets introduced in the way that Kel introduce Saj, and if you haven't met Saj, I would, I would encourage you to do the same thing. Meet him before he leaves. There are other people here too. You want to meet Mark Gardner, you want to meet Shaquille, you want to connect with people who are here, you want to go and speak to Natasha and connect with her. So whenever you go to a networking event, you want to make sure you start with the end in mind. While you're there, you want to be proactive. Does it make sense, right? You want to seek to understand before you want to be understood. You want to synergize with people, you want to look to collaborate. 
So you can use this model in any area of life. And sharpening the saw means you want to consistently work on yourself. How do you do that? You read the right books. You listen to the right people. You consistently work on your own skill set. You see, we never stop growing. And if you have stopped growing, it's a very, very good sign that you're on your way out. <laughs> the late, great Norman Vincent Peale used to tell his audiences, he used to say, how many of you don't have problems here? And nobody put up their hand. He said, that's a good thing. If anybody ever did put up their problem, they, sorry, their hand, and said, no, I don't have any problems. He said, wow, you better get on your knees right now and start praying for problems. Because problems, no problems mean you're on your way out. Problems mean you're alive. It's a sign of life. But you get to sharpen your saw. If you do sharpen your saw, it means you can handle your problems in a very effective manner. It means you can be proactive in the way you handle your problems. It means you can find solutions. And problems are a gift of life. And whenever you find a solution, then what shows up next is another problem. But if you keep sharpening your saw, it means you can now handle those problems effectively on an ongoing manner. So these are the seven habits and very effectively used in, other, in all areas of life if you approach them and you read this book and you apply what you learn in this book. If you're currently reading this book, or if you've read it before, I would re encourage you to revisit the book or maybe get the audio version and listen to it while you're driving around your car or listen to it on your iPod or your iPhone, etc. or l when you're lying in bed at night or first thing in the morning. It's a great listen. Now, when you look at this image here, what do you see? What's the first thing you see? Anybody? A beautiful lady. A beautiful lady. Who sees a beautiful lady? How many of you see an old lady, an older lady? How many of you don't see anything? <laughs> How many of you are not going to put up your hand? <laughs> you see both, right? When you obviously, when you look, you can see both. But there is both there, right? There's a beautiful lady and an older lady, right? You can see. Does anybody know, not know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Raise your hand, please, if you don't know what I'm talking about right now. If you'd like me to point out the two different ladies. Raise your hand if you'd like me to point them out. So here's the older lady with her nose. See, that's her big crooked nose there. And there's her downturned mouth with her chin. And her chin is buried in her coat. Right? And she's got something over her head. This is her hair hanging over her eyes. This is the beautiful lady who's looking in that direction, the same direction that Natasha and I were looking in the previous slide when we started. She's looking that way. This is her ear. This is her chin here. And this is her neck with a necklace around. And she's bearing a bit of her chest. You see that? The reason I... The reason I, you, thank you, Kel. <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. Good. Say again. What's that? So the reason I use this image here, my friends, is because it reminds me of a story that I heard Stephen Covey tell when he was in South Africa. And he told the story about paradigms. He used to use the word paradigms a lot. And he used to tell the story about how he, this man was traveling on a train. How many of you have ever heard him tell the story either on audio or in live in person? He tells a story about how this man was traveling on a train with his three kids. It was on the subway in New York. And his kids were running up and down the subway and they were knocking people's papers and they were screaming and making a noise and jumping around and holding on the bars, etc. And it was obvious that they were his kids. And eventually somebody went up to him and said, listen, can you control your children? And the man was buried deep in thought with his arms folded and his head was buried in his chest. And the man had to ask again, he said, please, excuse me, sir, are these your children? Can you control them? And the man looked up and kind of came out of a groggy fuzz. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, yes. He said, I'm sorry, we've, we've just come back from the hospital. And uh, we've just uh, heard that my wife died. Their mother's just passed away this morning. I'm sorry if they in everybody's face. I'll, let me tell them to calm down. And when he tells that story, if you're listening to the story, Immediately, if you were listening to the story, if you were listening to the story, you listen consciously. When you, when you hear, imagine if you were on a train and you were reading a paper and three kids were running up and down the, the, the carriage and they knocked your paper and they were screaming and making a noise and jumping and swinging. How many of you would get upset in your own mind and say, oh God, I wish somebody would control those kids? Raise your hand if that was you. And then if you went up to that man and asked that man to control his kids and he looked up and he said, I'm sorry, I just discovered my wife died. My wife has just passed away. How many of you immediately, the condemnation in your mind immediately changes now to compassion? This is a powerful story. And he used to tell it in a much longer period. I don't have much time, so I'm condensing it. However, it's very, very powerful and it shifts your paradigm immediately. So, you know, there's always two ways to look at life. The great philosopher Spinoza said, no matter how thin you slice it, there's always two sides. 
So the reason I'm telling you that is because it brings me back to one of the habits, which is I find is the most important habit, I think, is seek to be understood, sorry, seek to understand before you want to be understood. Because in today's world, life is living so life so quickly. And people, uh, you know, they find, don't find much time to connect with people effectively and properly. And Natasha mentioned something very, early, very important early on, and she says when you connect with someone, how many of you actually last time, when was the last time you really connected with someone, looked into their eyes, and listened to what they had to say? Because everybody wants to connect. And in today's life, we're living a life so fast and so quick, and we are being, our, our attention is being, you know, asked for in so many different directions, text, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Instagram, emails, you know, just so much, you know, competition for our attention. And very, very seldom do we ever get the time to connect with another human being. And so many people are living a life right now where they don't get that kind of opportunity. And they go home and they don't even get that kind of connection at home. So, uh, in this book review, uh, my purpose here is to remind you that there are some phenomenal books out there. This is one of the top, uh, Time, Time Magazine, in 2011, Time Magazine rated this as one of the top 15 business books written of all time. So, I would recommend that you read it again if you've read it already. If you haven't read it, read it, read it, you know, read it your first time. And if you're not a great reader, then you want to get it on audio and listen to it on audio. Uh, so, that's the seven habits of highly effective people. If you want to stay in touch with me, by all means, stay in touch with me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you.